I'm 25 years old now, and I still remember this event pretty distinctly. At the time of when this event occurred, I was living in Aurora, Ohio, near Cleveland. I had one younger brother who wasn't present for some reason. The time of which this event occurred was probably either after school or during the middle of the day on a weekend. I don't remember. I do, however, remember that it was in broad daylight. My brother and I shared a room with a bunk bed in which the bottom bunk was perpendicular to the top bunk allowing for a sort of cubby of space underneath the top bunk. There was a small area of space, I'd say, probably about a foot in width between the back and the lower bed, and the wall it was near. My friend from class and I were sitting at the foot of the lower bed, at the opposite end, away from the underneath portion of the bunk bed, near the wall. We were playing with Pokemon cards. This was in like 2001 or 2002, so Pokemon was all the rage at this point for young kids. This was around the time period that Game Boy advancements were released. Everything was normal, and we were having a conversation as we were messing around with the cards. Then all of a sudden, something at the back of the bed caught the corner of my eye. Naturally, I turned to look to see what it was. As I looked to my left, the seemingly normal conversation I was having with my friend abruptly and ominously came to a halt, and both of us stared in bewilderment in complete silence for, I'd say, a good three seconds. It was very quick. When I turned, I saw a green hand which had come up from the back space behind the bed and was feeling the pillow and the bed in the area where my brother would put his head to sleep. Like I said, the whole thing lasted maybe about three seconds and then the hand vanished. I don't remember if it went back behind the bed or if it just dissipated. It happened very quickly. As soon as the hand disappeared, I broke the ominous silence and asked my friend sitting next to me, Did you see that? He replied, The hand, confirming that we both saw the same phenomenon. I ran across the house and told my mother what we had just seen, and she quickly brushed it off and told me it was nothing. I went back to the same room and continued playing with my friend. I wouldn't say that my friend and I were particularly scared by the event, though it was definitely very strange. I never told my little brother about it, who slept in the lower bunk bed. To this day, I remember this event distinctly, and I've looked online and have found other events that were similar to this event described on the internet. Other people claim to have seen hands in their house. Has anyone else heard of this before? This is an experience that happened with my friend, who was sleeping over at my house. We had a finished basement that we dubbed the second living room. It was our hangout with an old couch, chair, and all of our gaming consoles. My friend slept in the basement when she spent the night. I was in my room upstairs, and always told her she was more than welcome to sleep in my room, or at least the actual living room. She always declined because of how it got upstairs. She told me that she was laying down on the couch, having a hard time falling asleep. She was on her side with her back out to the room. She was feeling okay for a bit, but suddenly felt like someone was in the room with her. She turned around to see if it was me or my sister, but didn't see anything. She turned back around and just kind of laid there for a bit longer. Suddenly, she heard a man's voice start talking. She flipped around and saw a figure sitting on the chair on the other side of the room. She stares at it for a second, trying to get a good look at it. She realises that it doesn't really have any features. It's just the shape of a person sitting in the chair. Soon, it actually speaks to her. According to her, it asks how she was doing. She answers that she's doing fine and asks how he's doing. Typical southern girl. They carry on a conversation full of your typical small talk. Towards the end of the conversation... The figure asks, did I frighten you? She answered honestly and told her that she was startled because he kind of popped out of nowhere. He stood up and moved towards the stairwell and said, good, before walking up the stairs. At this point, she loses it. She calls me and yells that I need to get down there ASAP. I'm thinking she hurt herself or something, so I was down there in about 30 seconds. She's crying and tells me that someone was in the basement with her. I thought she meant someone had broken in through the one window that was there. We laid on a hill, 
and that one wall was above ground. I look at the window and see it's perfectly fine. I start to ask her what she means by that and she tells me about the figure and talking to it. I asked her why she made me come downstairs instead of coming up and she said she was paralysed after hearing it say good. She was so scared by this. She wouldn't even go upstairs until I brought down our dog to walk her back up. This is the same dog in my doorknob story and her thought process was he would protect her. Parker was more than happy to come down so she took that to mean it was safe to go. She decides she wants to sleep on my floor and have Parker there just in case. After that, she didn't sleep over again. Can't really blame her for that. This experience is one I share with my sister. The beginnings of it are a bit hazy, I'll admit. For whatever reason, I was sleeping in my sister's room. I think we may have watched a scary movie and I was too chicken to sleep in my own room. Needless to say, I don't remember why I was in there, but that's where the story took place. We're sitting on her bed around 1am. We had a dog that slept in my sister's room at the time, so he was there too. Parker, the dog, had fallen asleep, so we were trying not to wake him up. He's loud when he's rowdy. So we're just playing on our phones, showing each other videos, cracking jokes, the usual. We had to be quiet because both parents were in bed and it was a weeknight. I think we were on some school break. I'm not 100% sure though. After a while of nothing interesting happening, Parker shoots his head up. My sister and I are both caught off guard. We stop what we're doing and listen to see what woke him up. We don't hear anything in the hall and turn our attention back to our phones. Parker is still staring at the door a few minutes after we stop paying attention. My sister tries to get his attention so he would lay back down and go to sleep. She has no luck getting Parker to even acknowledge that she's there, let alone responding to his name or pets. After a few more minutes of him staring the door down and my sister trying to get his attention, something happens. The doorknob was a bit loose in the door. Years of kids grabbing and pulling will do that to a doorknob. It looked and sounded like someone was on the other side of the door, wiggling the knob up and down extremely fast. Parker hears and sees this and goes nuts. He jumps off the bed, gets between the door and the bed. We're still sitting on it at this point, and it's just snapping and snarling in a way that we've never ever heard from him before. It was honestly terrifying. My sister and I were completely frozen. We didn't know what to do. Parker was showing all the signs of a dog in full-on aggression mode. His ears were back, his hackles were raised, and it looked like he was trembling. I thought at the time that maybe he was so angry, he was shaking, but looking back, I honestly think he was trembling out of fear. Of course, because it was 1am on a weeknight, it took my parents about three seconds to get out of bed and come storming into the room. My dad throws open the door and starts yelling at everyone. He thought we got Parker startled. He soon realises that my sister and I are crying, and Parker peacefully lay down on the floor and was watching my dad. My mom comes in and asks me why, why we got Parker startled, and why we were crying so hard. We told her that we didn't do anything. Parker heard the doorknob being wiggled around and jumped up and went nuts. Of course, my dad is a typical non-believer, and said that we must have had a dream and scared Parker when we woke up. We knew there was no point in arguing with him, because he never believed us when he told him of this weird shit in our house. My mum was a bit more reassuring and laid with us for the rest of the night. Nothing else happened after my parents came into the room. Growing up in my childhood home, my friends and I spent a lot of time in the ditch between my neighbour's house and mine. We'd also do a whole bunch of things like crawling through the drainage pipes, only when sunny of course, playing in the ditch while it rained, it was super fun when the water built up, and other forms of tomfoolery. One day, I was hanging out in the ditch with a couple of my friends when we heard this whistling. We all went quiet for a moment and listened very hard. It was getting closer and closer while we all looked around, panicked, trying to figure out if someone was messing with us. We all got out of the ditch looking around everywhere and didn't see anyone. Soon, it sounds like the whistling was coming from behind us and we booked it to my house. 
We all took a few minutes to settle down and were still looking around to see if it was someone's older sibler being a jerk. But we never saw anyone. We all discussed how scared we were and how it felt like the hairs on the back of our necks stood up, the closer the whistling got. We never saw anything and we never heard the approach of anyone that might have been whistling. Once, my mum and I were taking a walk around our neighbourhood to get out the house for a little bit. We were a couple of streets away from our streets and walking next to the local park. It was midsummer in the middle of Georgia, so the temperature was about 95 degrees. We were just chatting about different things when both of us got silent as we walked through an ice cold spot. It was two seconds at the most, but the change in temperature was very jarring. We got through the spots and walk in silence a bit further down the road. I broke the silence first and asked her if she felt the icy spot back there. She looked at me and nodded her head and said she also felt like we were being watched and weren't supposed to go through the spot. The mood had drastically changed and we decided to end the walk early and go home. Lastly, a bunch of friends and I were at a neighbourhood park and we are typical obnoxious middle school teenagers. We were sitting around the picnic table area and were laughing and joking. My younger sisters was there and I happened to be best friends with someone with the same name. We're all laughing and joking together when suddenly a few of us hear something calling my sisters and friends name. We weren't sure who it was directed at so I put both to be safe. Those of us who heard it the first time quickly told the others to be quiet and listen. We heard it again and more clearly because everyone was quiet now. It was very unsettling the way the name was said. None of us could tell the gender of the voice or pinpoint where exactly it was coming from. It kept saying the name over and over, getting more drawn out each time it was said. There were a few other kids and parents at the park in the play area, so we figured it was one of them calling their kid. However, we were all watching them and they were on the other side of the park, which means they would have had to be yelling for us to hear them. This voice that said the name was not yelling. After that, we decided to go our separate ways and go home for the night. We didn't go back to the park for a while. I was around 12 years old and sitting on the back of my dad's truck with a tailgate down. I was waiting for my friend to meet up with me so we could do whatever 12 year olds do on a weekend. It was a spring day in Georgia, so everything was alive and very noisy. Dogs were barking, birds were chirping, and bugs were screaming. After sitting there for a while, everything goes silent. There wasn't a peep. I looked around to see if there were any birds or dogs around me. There wasn't. When I turned to look at the street, there was a black, misty, shapeless form walking from my neighbours across the street from me to their neighbour's yard. As I'm watching it move, I whisper in disbelief, what the hell is that? Apparently it heard me because it stopped as soon as I said it and looked like it was turning towards me. Although it was shapeless, it was thinner while moving and kind of thickened out like a normal person would when you look at them head on. It stood there for what felt like an eternity and, I'm guessing, stared me down. My heart was beating very fast and I don't think I was breathing. It started to move towards me and was about to step into the street when I heard my friend yell to me from up the street. The way the houses were built, she couldn't see the side of the street with the form. I snapped my head to her, raised my hand so she knows I'm there and immediately go back to look for the form. It wasn't there anymore. Once I saw that it was gone, everything came back to life. All the noise expected at springtime hit me at once and I became extremely overwhelmed and started to cry. My friend reached me and saw that I was crying. She was rightfully confused and asked why I was upset. I told her everything that I experienced and she got quiet. She told me she saw it not too long before I did at her house and told me that she was terrified during the encounter. She said it started to move towards her from the neighbor's yard, like me, into hers and she was completely frozen. She broke out of that trance because her mom told her she needed to come inside for dinner. Because we were so spooked by that, we decided it was a good day to have a movie marathon. I never saw it again, 
But I do believe I had other encounters with it. So, was it a ghost? Or was it a demon? In Meriden, Connecticut, about 40 minutes outside of where I live, there exists a range of mountainous trap rock ridges called Hanging Hills. The easiest way to get to them is to park in a wooded mountainous park called Hubbard Park and take a trail that starts with a slightly intimidating passenger bridge that crosses over the highway. I'm afraid of heights, but always try to challenge myself by going hiking and putting myself in slightly uncomfortable situations to overcome my fears. In the spring of 2014, my wife, girlfriend at the time, and I decided to take our umpteenth hike up Hanging Hills to see Castle Craig, a stone tower that stood at the end of the main trail and overlooked the cliffs, the city of Meriden and Quinnipiac Valley. For the umpteenth time, we launched into a discussion on the drive there about the legend of the black dog. I find ghost stories that have any shred of historical reality to them intriguing, because most representations of ghosts on TV or YouTube these days involve people becoming easily scared by shaking or noises in an abandoned location. The Legend of the Black Dog is an exception because it involves the legend itself and a story of two geologists from the late 1800s encountering it and actually documenting it. The legend has it that you see the Black Dog of Hanging Hills once for joy, twice for sorrow, and three times for death. There are plenty of legends of black dogs in folklore that tell a similar tale. The two geologists, W.H.C. Pynchon and Herbert Marshall, were conducting research of the area in the winter of 1891, when they encountered the black dog. According to the story, Pynchon had seen it once and Herbert twice before. Herbert didn't believe in the legend. After ascending the hills again alone, Herbert supposedly fell to his death. I remembered the image of the black dog from the WHC Pynchon story was very clear every time we hike up the mountain. This time was no different. That particular day, my girlfriend and I encountered a hiker on the trail that was letting his black dog without a collar roam loose. We weren't sure whether it was to mess with people or not. The dog wasn't little like the one depicted in Pynchon's story. Rather, it was a bigger like a lab terrier mix and friendly too. It came up to us and started panting at our legs. Sorry about that, the hiker said, as he caught up to the dog and us. Not at all. I bet you love having a little legend with you around here. Oh yeah, the ghost dog, the hiker said, forcing a laugh and grimacing, as if he'd heard that one too many times before. As he walked away, my girlfriend made a comment about my obsession with the stupid dog and not wanting to hear about it. We made our way to Castle Craig about 20 minutes later. Unlike the trails off the highway, the main trail from the park is not long or difficult, other than a large hill at the end of it. We took pictures on top of the tower and by the cliffside, not really thinking anymore about the black dog. We had made so many trips up to the tower and seen so many hikers with black dogs, that the legend almost seemed like a joke at that point. Want to take the main trail down or the road? I asked, as we finished up taking pictures and drinking whatever water and Gatorade we had left in our packs. The road, she insisted. We can see that river. The road leading up to Castle Craig is typically taken by cars and bikers. We sometimes hike down it to catch a glimpse of the Quinnipiac River on the way back to the park. Despite it being a warm April day, there were very few cars and bikers on the way down. It was nice and quiet. About a quarter of a mile into our walk, my girlfriend tugged me on the shoulder and pointed to a figure on the side of the road between some shrubbery. It stood about ten feet ahead of us. What the hell is that? she said. I took a step forward but she tugged on my shirt and shook her head. Is that what I... I nodded. All I could do was nod. The figure was small and resembled a black dog with floppy ears and a hot dog tail, much like the one in Pynchon's illustration. I wouldn't have thought much of it if not for the fact the figure was blurry. It wasn't the distance between us that made it blurry and there weren't any fog related conditions that day. It was almost as if mother nature had taken the dog in a photoshop program and used the blur effect on it. Even when I took a step closer 
To my girlfriend's hesitance, it still looked blurry. We were frozen, otherwise though, and didn't think to take a picture of the figure. There was an unknowing understanding between us that we shouldn't approach and just wait for it to cross. As the figure crossed the road, it didn't look at us. It just dawdled with its nose to the ground. For the rest of the hike, we were silent. We both knew what we saw, but couldn't put it into words. It was only after a while that I said I should have taken a picture, but deep down, I felt it was a good thing that I didn't. Seeing the figure wasn't frightening, but it wasn't particularly pleasant either. We've been back to Hanging Hills many times since. We never encountered any luck or sorrow, just a memory of a little blurry back dog, and an understanding that when you see an actual paranormal entity with someone else and understand what it is, there isn't really a question about it. I've read many stories posted online since about the black dog. Few have described what we saw though. Black dogs run loose in the park all the time, and a number of the encounters we read about seem like fabrications or just encounters with stray dogs. For most of my life, my grandparents lived in a small town on the border of Maine and New Hampshire. To even get to the house, you had to travel through several back roads that were not lit by any streetlights. They built the house from the ground up in the early 90s with the help of family members and a small construction crew. It was an idealistic brick and wood style house with three bedrooms, a half finished basement and a porch that was sealed off from the rest of the house. Growing up, my brother and I used to spend at least one week of summer alone at the house. My grandparents weren't the warm type, but they would take us hiking, bring us to the beach, and let us roam the property on our own. My grandparents' house had what seemed like endless woods surrounding it, and miles of tall grass that separated their property from their neighbor's house. When my brother was 11 and I was 8, we went exploring one afternoon in an attempt to find that neighbor's house. My grandparents were off gardening and didn't care so much about what we went, as long as we were home for dinner. That's the way it was with the seven boys they raised, and they didn't feel it would be any different with their grandkids. As we made our way through the tall grass, we cut ourselves on the blades, and I was bit by a garter snake. We were unfazed though, because unless we're seriously injured, my grandparents paid no mind and had the boys will be boys attitude. With the grass so tall, it was tough to know how far we were from either house. Eventually, we stumped upon a patch of dead grass and a peach tree. It seemed odd to find a peach tree in the middle of nowhere, but we were excited and started picking peaches off the tree. We sat atop the branches, burying our faces in the juiciest peaches that tasted nothing like what our mom bought us from the grocery store. After a few minutes, we saw a figure standing under the tree. It was an African-American woman in a rose pink embroidered dress. She looked middle-aged and tired. A moment later, we noticed a young boy and girl about our age standing behind her. The boy was wearing overalls and a white t-shirt, and the girl was wearing a sundress. Their outfits looked unusual, but we didn't question them. We just stared, though, as the woman smiled. Go ahead and eat the peaches, she said, smiling. We just stared blankly at her. It's okay. We smiled, said thanks, and grabbed a few peaches to take with us. You two look tired. Where do you live? We're at our grandparents' house over there. She nodded, but never told us where they lived. My brother had spotted another snake in the grass and darted after it. The two kids laughed and watched as he wrangled the snake and slung it across his shoulder as if he was Indiana Jones. I tried to catch another nearby snake, but fell flat on my face. By the time I got up from the ground, the woman and her children were gone. When we went back to my grandparents' house, we told them about finding the peach tree and coming across her neighbor and kids. She was only half paying attention though and made some sort of comment about how it was nice kids still played outside. About 20 years later, when my grandparents had sold the house and moved to a mobile home in New Hampshire, I asked her if she remembered her African-American neighbours that lived next door. This gave her pause as she struggled to remember. There was a French woman who lived there, she told me, but not African-American. Maybe she had friends over. 
No, she said, confused. She lived alone, and hardly anyone visited her. I started to think that I had dreamt of the events because it happened so long ago. When I recently asked my brother, he thought it was interesting that I never brought it up after all this time. He had thought he might have dreamt it too. He remembered the family and remembered the peach tree, but a couple of summers later when he went up to my grandparents' house alone, he tried to retrace our steps but couldn't find any peach tree. He only saw the old French woman that lived there for many years. For years, I've struggled to think of a logical explanation for that event. I even tried best to research the property we had searched for. Turns out, like my grandparents, the French woman had her house built on the property. Before then, the property had just been woods and one long flowing field of tall grass. I also discovered that peach trees do grow in Maine, and the type of clothing I remembered the woman and her children wearing were most popular in the 1930s. There were no records of the property before the 1960s though, when the French woman had her house built. Growing up, I absolutely hated being home. At night, it always sounded like someone was walking around, and there were whispers from my closet whenever it was left open. I always made sure it was closed, but most mornings it would be partially open. I would refuse to go into the basement even during the day, as you could never escape the feeling of someone or something watching you. I'm talking full-on blankets over the head, nose poking out type of childhood. One night in the summer, we had a powerful thunderstorm roll through. I remember it vividly because the lightning was near constant, and instead of white and blue, the colours were more purple and green. The storm took out the power. My father asked me to go to the kitchen and help get the candles and flashlights. I was walking down the dark hallway when something jumped out from the bathroom. The kitchen door was five feet behind it. Thinking it was my dad trying to scare me, I laughed and said, nice try. There was a loud growl, and my father put his hand on my shoulder from behind me. He pulled me back into the living room, closed and locked the door, while saying that it wasn't him, and he saw it too. The growling continued from the kitchen entryway for a good ten minutes, and it sounded like something was pacing the hallway. Then I, Dad and I spent the night in the living room. We didn't sleep. We just watched the door. We moved a few months later. The house we moved to felt good. I had no issues with feeling watched or hearing things. Felt like I could sleep without the blankets over my head. Years later, when my father was diagnosed with cancer, we started watching ghost shows on cable. They got us talking about that night and what we saw. It was then my father revealed that the house I grew up in was an old, renovated funeral home. The way the house was renovated, my closet was the mechanical room for the lift to bring the bodies from the basement embalming room to the viewing room on the first floor. Our floor was the funeral director's private living space. My father's aunt actually owned the house and lived on the first floor, which was the floor where they would have the viewings and such. The house has changed hands to cousins of mine. Talking with them, they said they had similar experiences. Scratching on the wall, footsteps, banging on the basement bulkhead, and lights that would come on dimly as if they were connected in series, rather than each light being its own circuit. They even told me they won't go into the basement alone, because the stairs go past the walk-in storage room with no lights, and they swore they heard breathing and or growling when they went past. They have since moved from that house also. We lived there for 13 years, 1977 to 1990. It wasn't until after the incident during the storm in 1990 that my father decided it was time to move. I made a note of every experience we had, individually and as a family, in a journal. I'll go room by room. I should note that I wasn't allowed in my parents' room for obvious reasons, and I was able to debunk the noises once my teenage years set in. Parents had a healthy relationship. Every room in common. Cold spots, old smells were common throughout the house. 
We attributed that to the old steam radiator heaters. Scratching on walls at night, no rats or vermin, no insect activity or plumbing issues. Dad was a maintenance foreman. He checked everything out. Also of note, there were no trees close enough to the house. You always felt like you were being watched. None of my friends ever stayed over or wanted to come inside the house. They always said the house creeped them out. Now onto the experiences by specific room. Entryway A. The interior door of the entryway was wood with glass panes. This opened to a stairwell that leads down to the main floor. The entryway door was always locked at night. The door had an old hook and latch style door closure with a thumbs button to operate it. It was very secure, but on many occasions my father would find the door slightly open or completely open when he got up. Sometimes it was so early enough in the night you could hear the click from the hatch. The hallway runner would always be bunched up, even though the door cleared it easily. Bathroom F. This is the room where the thing jumped out of the hallway during the storm. You never entered the bathroom in the dark. Almost the entire back of the door was covered by a mirror. Anyone closing the bathroom door always covered the mirror because it never felt right. You could see shadows move in the reflection, but not when you turned to see behind you. We couldn't take the mirror down as it had been basically painted into place. The thought of busting the mirror always made you feel nauseous and sick. The kitchen, G. Cabinets would open and close. The bell for the toaster would ding at odd times, even if the toaster was off or unplugged. Dining room E. The main light over the table would turn on dimly red at odd times. The bulb was a bright white incandescent. At night, you could hear the old push button switch get pushed because the click was so loud. Pantry H. The room always see sleeved me out. The room was like a walk-in closet for dry goods and the like. As soon as you entered, you felt like bugs were crawling all over you. But there was never a bug in sight. No spiders, nothing. Also, you made your selection quickly because you always felt like something was going to drop on you from above. Very unsettling. Sun porch slash sunroom, I. For Christmas one year, my father got me a Fonzie pinball machine. It was kept unplugged when not in use. On a few occasions, you could hear the chuk chung of the flippers or the sound of a ball rolling down the game field. Dad thought the game was malfunctioning, but it wasn't. There was also an electronic bowling lane. The ball would roll around the room at night sometimes, and the game played music if you got a strike. The music would sound at odd times and off speed. This is also where the attic access was. Attic J. Now the cool thing about the attic was that the former funeral director had a full bar and billiard table in the attic, along with a spare guest room. How we got that stuff up there is a mystery, because the attic entryway was super narrow. Oddly, the attic was calm. I remember a wood carving just past the door that depicted Ireland, and etched into the wood was... A Gaelic message. When we moved, we took the wood carving with us, with permission. I'm only the third generation in the family who wasn't born in Ireland. My dad hung out on the front door of our new house. My grandfather could read Gaelic and translated the meaning, and it roughly translated, Ireland protects those that cross this threshold. I had some issues as a child. I'm not afraid to admit that now. My parents did the right thing and took me for professional help. One of the recommendations of the psychiatrist was to keep a journal, and I did. Faithfully. Now initially it had things I was experiencing, like difficulty relating to kids at school. Bullying, self-doubt of my abilities, things of that nature. In April of 96, my psychiatrist wanted me to focus on things that frightened me, or made me feel uncomfortable. This was what he thought was a significant problem, and now, I agree it was. In the end, it really helped me find my way in life and face my fears head on, and I attribute my success to these sessions. 
Never be afraid to get help. There are many people who have experienced similar things. You're not alone. I have to admit, going back and reading this journal, which I kept along with class photos and yearbooks, my spelling and grammar have improved considerably, and there were lots of things I forgot about. First entry about my house. April 1986. My bedroom and closet. It's morning, and I couldn't be happier. Last night was scary. I woke up and it was still very dark. I heard scratching from my closet, so I got up and turned on my room light to make sure my hamster didn't escape. She didn't, she's still in her cage. I checked the closet and it was closed. Turned off the light and went back to bed. I tried to go back to sleep, but I kept hearing sounds. It sounded like my closet latch. I think it was being lifted up. I heard it click. After the latch clicked, it felt like something was in the room with me. It felt like I was being watched. I covered my head with my blankets. I heard something moving in my room. My hamster was quiet. She wasn't running in her wheel tonight or biting her water dispenser. I thought something might have harmed her, but she seemed okay. I hoped my mum or dad would be checking my window, but it's not summer and the windows are closed. The sound was in my room and moving around. It was near my toy box, not my window. My toy box is at the foot of my bed. I heard a G.I. Joe fall over. I'm not alone. My dad woke up and got ready for work. That means it was four. He always farts or sneezes first thing. That's how I know it's him in the hallway. I'm alone in my room now. I was able to sleep once I heard dad moving in the house. I told my dad when he got home from work what happened in the night and morning. Dad opened my closet to show me it was just stuff. It was very cold in the closet. He thinks I might have dreamed it. Mom does too. Could I have? No. My closet door was not latched and slightly open this morning. Even now with the sun up and as I'm writing this, something is watching me from the closet. I know I closed it before bedtime. There's also a rip in my Transformers sleeping bag at my feet. Second entry about my house. May 1986, early evening. I helped my dad cut the grass today. After that, we had to put away the tools and equipment. Unfortunately, these have to go back into the basement. I really hate the basement. It doesn't feel right, which means I get goosebumps. It smelled stuffy and heavy, like moss and very old pennies. I was helping to put away the grass catcher when dad asked me if I saw something move along the tool wall. I think he was trying to tease me because I was really jumpy about being so far into the basement. What I didn't want to tell him was that I did see something move along that wall. It moved to the corner, then it moved up the wall and then it was gone. The worst part of the basement was the storage area by the stairs. It's really dark and there's no light to turn on. I won't go in there. Ever. I won't even shine a light in that room, because I have nightmares about that creepy room sometimes, and in them, the floor is bloodstained. I also believe that whatever has been up to my closet at night comes up from this storage room of the basement. I stay as far away from the opening as possible, because also in my nightmares there's something in there that will pull me in if I get too close. We finish putting all the tools away, and Dad always has to has me go before him, because the old wooden stairs are loose. We make it out of the basement, and my dad padlocks the door. We share a key with my Aunt Jay and Uncle Jay. We usually run into Uncle Jay after cutting the grass. He's a nice guy, and likes to make models. He always warned me about going into the basement alone. I always took him seriously. Dad would say that Uncle Jay was just trying to spook me. Late evening. Mom asked me to help make the casserole and asked me to get the mac and cheese and the soup from the pantry. I don't like the pantry either. It reminds me too much of my closet. I really want the casserole, so I went into the pantry and tried to pull the light cord, but I couldn't find it. I think something touched my hand and I jumped back quickly and I closed the pantry door. 
I'm trying to calm down when my mum says it's just my imagination. I tried again and found the light cord. The light goes on and I gather the stuff. I think it's odd that I can smell the basement in the pantry. And just then, along the back of the pantry wall, I see a large grey pile of what I think are worms, wiggling like the night crawlers I help dad get for fishing. I drop the stuff to the floor and step back. My mother comes over and I point, and my mother must have seen it too, because she let out a gasp and chucked the soup can at it. She then closed the door and called for my dad. Mom said she thinks she saw a squirrel of something in the pantry. Dad had a look, no squirrel, also no hole in the wall, no nothing. I helped my mom make the casserole. We both kept an eye on the pantry door while cooking. Mom told me that maybe we have imaginary issues. Late evening. As I'm writing this, I'm in my bedroom, burping casserole. I'm a bit worried about tonight, as I was in the basement today and it likely saw me. I know what that means for tonight. The next morning. I woke up and it was morning. I guess helping dad cut the lawn and that must have helped me sleep through the night. I hear my parents talking in the kitchen. Mom was asking dad if he could figure out why all the kitchen cabinets were wide open. I heard them talking about maybe the house settling or maybe I didn't close them tight after helping with dinner cleanup. All the close them tight part. I looked over at my closet, which was again partially open, and the hairs on my arms stood up. I jumped at the sound of three knocks on my bedroom door. I looked over, expecting to see one or both of my parents, but no one was there. I then heard three knocks from the closet door and I bolted from my bed, kicked the closet door closed and I went right to my parents, knowing I couldn't explain that I made sure the cabinets and my closet, for that matter, were closed. Third entry about my house. June 1986, afternoon. My parents got me the D&D red box. I'm really excited because I got a chance to play in a summer camp last year and it was really fun. My therapist said I needed something to focus my imagination on and to give me an outlet. I'm not sure why I need a wall plug, but he's a doctor. My cousin, three years younger than me, is coming over today for the weekend. I'll let him know about what goes on at night here. No one seems to believe me when I tell them the things that I've seen, except my Uncle Jay. Evening. My room. My cousin will be here until Sunday. We spent a bunch of time reading the D&D rule books. My cousin wanted to tell scary stories. I told him if we're unlucky, we'll be in one. And I explained what I had been seeing lately. He laughed it off, but requested we use a nightlight. Night. My room. My parents had gone to bed, and my cousin and I had just finished going over the rule books, colouring in the dice numbers, and trying to make our first characters. We lost track of time, and soon discovered that we were almost 1.15 in the morning. We decided it was time to turn in. I checked the closet, and it was closed and latched. We had sleeping bags, Transformers for me, Spider-Man for the cuz, on the floor. We continued to goof off a bit, when the room got very cold, like a window opened. Just as my cousin went, we both heard a loud click. We both peered over the top of the bed and saw the closet was no longer closed completely. We also noticed the nightlight was getting dimmer, and the room darker. Suddenly, the room went pitch black as the nightlight went completely out. There were two large windows in my room, but there wasn't even any moonlight coming in. When the nightlight came back on the closets was more open, and we both saw something dark in the corner near a window. The nightlight went out again. The room got dark except for the moonlight coming in the window this time. The moonlight was broken by what looked like a set of three-fingered hands reaching into it. Grabbing our sleeping bags, we ran to the living room, clicked on all the lights, and, and camped as close as we could to my parents' room. My hamster's cage was moved to the dining room because I told my parents that maybe that was the noise I could hear at night and that's what was waking me up. She had been in her exercise wheel 
when my cousin and I ran from my room. I remember hearing the sound of her running the tube to get to her nest area. Then the house was silent. Silent until my dad tripped over my cousin. He was about to chew us out for making so noise so late or early, but a door slammed in my room and he went to check it out. We camped out in the living room. When my dad came back, he said he'll fix the closet latch and that we shouldn't be reading monster books so late at night, sliding the red box to me. Oddly enough, he said we will spend the rest of the weekend at my grandmother's house. My cousin vowed to never spend the night at my house again. Entryway, Dad brought me home after spending the weekend with my grandparents. It was honestly the best night's sleep I've had in a long time. Quiet, calm, and smelled like Grandma's cooking. As we got closer to home, just seeing it, I feel sick to my stomach. On entering, I actually stopped and dropped the overnight bag. The house felt different. Before I left with my cousin, it felt spooky and frightening. But now, the only thing I can feel is just seething anger. Fourth entry about my house. July 1987. General observation. I'm out of therapy, no more journal. I'm feeling better about myself and more self-confident. Meeting weekly in school for a D&D club transferred to meeting as a group of friends during summer vacation to play. I can honestly admit that I'm finally feeling more like a kid, or should I say teenager, as even I have noticed I'm becoming a bit more observant of girls, at least when I'm outside of the house. It's now late July and summer, long hot nights of little sleep. Everyone was always upset and angry at home. We need a few days of rain to cool the house and tempers down or something was going to give. Night. My room. It's hot and sticky and none of the fans are helping. My dad was working on fixing the AC for the living room, but he retired for the night after watching the 11 o'clock news. Our neighbours are outside. I can hear them talking and smell whatever they're cooking. I'm just waiting for exhaustion to take me. Early morning, my room. Something hit me in the night. It felt like a punch and I awoke with my face and chest hurting. My glow-in-the-dark alarm clock showed me it was 3.07am. I got out of bed and flipped my room light on. My eyes immediately locked to the closet and to my surprise, it was latched and closed. I noticed that my hands have blood on them and there's blood on my chest. I headed for the bathroom. Night. Approximately 3.15am, bathroom. Light on, I close the door and look at the damage in the medicine cabinet mirror. Split lip, dark mark around the side of my mouth. The busted lip where the, where the blood came from. There are three marks on my chest as big as a quarter. They hurt. I'm sure they'll be bruised by tomorrow afternoon, as will my face. For some reason, I got angry at my reflection. It felt like every bad thought or negative feeling I've had about myself came back ten times over, and all at once. In disgust with seeing myself and how I was feeling, I open the cabinet so I don't have to see my reflection. The cabinet mirror is now facing the mirror behind the door. I start to notice small movement in the reflections of the mirrors in the door mirror. I caused an infinity reflection due to the mirrors reflecting each other. This meant there were multiple reflections of me. Now at my limit, I angrily tossed a towel that happened to land on the robe hook. The towel covered the mirror and I could feel the pressure in the room subside considerably. I gathered myself, went through a few of the coping techniques I learned, and finished cleaning myself up and then exited the bathroom. For some reason, before turning the light to the bathroom off, I looked to the kitchen. The door leading to the sunroom and the back stairs was fully open. I shut the bathroom lights out but there was still a glow from the rooms across from me. Dining room. The lights over the table are on, but not on. They're glowing dimly, even though we don't have dimmers in the house. I'm still angry from the feeling in the bathroom, and I couldn't stop myself from saying what was on my mind. Go to hell. The lights faded out, but I felt still. Suddenly my father's there, and I'm about to jump out of my skin. 
He asked me what I was doing up. He flipped the light on and saw me. Thinking that I may have been harming myself, he's checking out the marks and swollen lip. He's being loud when asking me what I did, loud enough to wake my mother. The angry feeling the room flooded again, and the lights once again glowed dim. My dad looked at them with a puzzled, how the hell, look, just as my mom entered the dining room. I again almost jumped out of my skin as my 100 pound 5'2 mother lunged at my 6 foot 325 pound father, howling at dad to leave him alone and don't touch him. I hit the lights for the dining room which can be in full brilliance and I can see my mother as her hands along the side of my father's face, her fingernails digging into the back of his ears with blood running down his neck. My father has a grip on her shoulders. I forced myself between them and split them apart, telling my mother that dad didn't do this and explained what happened. I asked them if they couldn't feel that something wasn't right in the house. They seemed to have cleared their minds. Dad and mum talk. Mum doesn't know what came over her and was just in full mama bear mode. Dad cleaned the blood off his neck, then we all talked. This time it seemed my parents might be grasping that something else might be at work here. Dad went to check the door to the back stairs. He said it wasn't wide open, but was mostly closed and unlatched. The afternoon of the day after the night, my parents have worked things out. My father spoke with Uncle Jay, and he decided that we needed a vacation, and we packed up some things and took off for New Hampshire for five days. Fifth entry about my house. Information from my father in 2013. So I've now reached the point where, as an adult, I started talking to my dad about all the crazy thing that happened to us when I was growing up. I'll provide that information as it's applicable. My age when talking to my dad, 40. My age for this entry, 14 going on 15. I was, it was at this point that dad revealed that the house was a funeral home before being purchased and renovated into a multi-family house. According to my father, the activity started when I was very young, only a toddler. It happened one evening after one of my aunt's friends felt something about the house and wanted to have it and then held a seance. Then the feeling in the house changed from just creepy to horrific, because my aunt realised the seance must have been the reason that the house had activity. Unfortunately, she doubled down on the issue by having that same friend come to do a cleansing. They didn't know what they were doing, just enacted something they had read in a book and according to dad, likely did it wrong and just riled everything up. My dad believed that moving was the best option for us as nothing seemed to follow if he left the house. To that end, my parents were trying to save for a down payment on a house, but we had a string of health issues that would undercut the savings. My father believed that they, mom and himself, were not in control of their emotions for my fourth entry. When we went on vacation, Everything went back to normal between my parents and I. Also, while on vacation, my uncle had the house blessed by a priest. This priest was a friend and kin to my uncle. And this is what seems to have dialed everything down for a while, about two years. That changed in July 1988. July 1988, afternoon, outside the house. Things have been quiet at home. Creepy, but quiet. I've returned to you today because I was helping my aunt and uncle load food up for our family barbecue. While carrying the trays of food, I noticed movement in the basement window. My mum and dad were outside loading our car. My uncle was behind me and my aunt will not enter the basement. What I witnessed was approximately level with the basement window, which would make it about six feet tall, about my height now. It had a human-like shape head and shoulders, and it moved quickly to side to side. Uncle? Seen it too, didn't you, lad? Me? I think so. Aye, it's been biding its time, looking for a way out. Yes, what is it? Our clan call them Daemon, and they're not natural. They find and feed on fear, anger and sorrow. They sow these emotions like crops, then harvest the field. Well, Journal, looks like I won't be sleeping the rest of my time here. Parents are saving for a new house. Night, returning home from the barbecue. We've returned home to something completely unexpected. Several police officers are on the front porch. The police talk to my uncle and dad. 
My dad comes over to us and tells my mother to take me and go to my grandmother's. Dad tells us that apparently the kid broke in and damaged the place and they're checking for missing property. We headed to my grandmother's for the night. Morning, grandmother's house. Dad returned around mid-morning. He tells us that we'll likely have to stay here for a while. Nothing was taken, but there is damage and blood in the house. A neighbour called the cops when she noticed a broken window. My dad then goes into what happened, to the best of everyone's knowledge. Someone shattered the basement window along the side of the house near the oil ports. I had a bad feeling, because that was the window I saw my uncle's dame hen in. My dad continued. They apparently cut themselves on the glass. It looked like they slipped into the basement through the broken window, got a pry bar from the tool wall, and pried the basement door open. The cops found the locked padlock on the floor by the door. Then they damaged and destroyed the doors to open up the first floor, and then proceeded to damage or destroy the interior doors on our floor, except for the attic door and our living room doors. Mom asked my dad what he thought would have happened if we had been home. The colour left my father's face and his words chilled me. I don't know. Sixth entry about my house, September 1988, afternoon. It took us a few weeks, but my dad and I helped my uncle get the doors repaired. On our floor, the bathroom door was undamaged. All the other doors had been hacked into a pry bar. My uncle was a bit skittish with working in the house as it sometimes got things riled up. We finished in relative peace. Before that, it was still early in the afternoon. The three of us took the tools down to the tool board. As we passed the step off for the storage room, the temperature radiating from the room was at least 20 degrees colder. My glasses instantly fogged over and I almost fell into the storage room. My uncle caught me and pulled me back. We quickly gathered the tools I dropped, my uncle talking quietly under his breath. Do not look into the room, lad. Seek not the dame hen. We got the tools over to the board, only to discover all the tools are on the floor. We quickly get the tools back on the board, but the three of us can hear booted footsteps behind us by the basement stairs. My uncle decided to use the auxiliary stairs that bring us up a narrow stairway to the first floor into what I always thought was a closet was actually a stairwell into his living room. As we locked the door, something pounded on it three times. We run to the main basement door, pull it closed and clap the padlock on it. This door also gets pounded on three times. We backed away as the door rattled against the frame, then stopped. I had a quick word with my uncle. I thought it was gone. No lad, dormant maybe. We all went upstairs to wait in our living room. My uncle for my aunt, who was out with friends, and my father and I for my mother, who was working late. The phone rang, making everyone jump. I went and answered to hear my mother state she was just leaving work, so I let my dad know. My uncle, looking out the living room window, saw my aunt get dropped off and left to meet her. Half an hour later, my mother arrived home and I went down to the main entryway to help her with her belongings. This was something I always did because my mother worked so late before the weekend. As I met my mother at the door, before I could even greet her properly, my mother exclaimed, what is that? Looking past my shoulder. And that's when something hit me from behind, launching me outside into my mother, sending her backwards and down the outside stairs. The aftermath. ER trip for my mother and I. I got two bruised ribs, a bruised back, and a dislocated left shoulder. My mother, four bruised ribs, sprained wrist, fractured arm, and a sprained ankle. The damage, while not as severe as it could have been, wiped out the savings my parents had for moving. The official story was I slipped on a non-existent throw rug at the bottom of the stairs and caused the wipeout. Back at home, recovering. I asked my mother what she saw. She took out a Celtic cross necklace, a gift from my grandfather that I rarely see her wearing, the knot worked on it, forming the cross itself, and she held it in her hand and said only one word. Darkness. (laughs) 
seventh entry about my house. December 1988. I recover quicker than my mother from the September experience, but with the holidays coming, everyone is feeling a bit better. Our family tradition is to start decorating for Christmas after Thanksgiving. This means mom gets to break out her carols on vinyl and the Sears system belts out Bing, Nat King Cole, the three tenors and the like. I help my uncle decorate outside. Plastic toy soldiers, giant plastic candles, big bulb string lights, and a big plastic Santa that gets put up on the ledge outside our living room window. We secured it to the ledge and made sure there was no tension on the cords. The house, however, is still creepy. We can hear footsteps in the night, banging on doors and occasionally walls. And we all had this uneasy feeling with the bathroom mirror, to the point we permanently hung a thick cloth over it. But no big activity since September, and Christmas is typically a safe time of the year. Christmas Eve, my uncle always has a huge party. Lots of laughing, singing, drinking, lots of Irish prayers answered. Now traditionally, my uncle will announce that he thinks he hears reindeer bells, which gets the kids wanting to go home and officially ends the party. This year, however, it was a younger cousin who shouted, I hear Santa's footsteps, about two hours before the party was set to end. Sure enough, there are loud footsteps overhead, when all of a sudden, the room breaks out in peals of young children screaming. As right out the large front window, Santa swung back and forth, extension cord wrapped around his plastic neck. My father and I bolt upstairs because we know the plastic Santa was right out front of our living room window on a large overhang. I reach the stairwell door and to my surprise, the door is closed and locked. I get out my key and open it as my dad gets to the landing. I'd honestly expected it to be open. Inside, all the lights in the house are off, including our Christmas lights. Grab the flashlight that's on the kitchen counter near the door and shine the light down the hallway. The bathroom, pantry, living room, and parents' bedroom doors are closed, and the hallway runner is pulled back to the living room door. We go down the hallway and open the door to the living room. It takes a moment for my father and I to register what we see. The living room window is wide open with the plastic Santa gone. But the window plastic sheet is intact and still sealed to the window frame. We tear the plastic off, pull the Santa up and secure it back in place. We close, lock and dad gets the plastic to seal the window once again. There was no wind and no ice. Dad finishes applying the plastic sheet and tells me to go get my mother's hairdryer from her dresser top so we can seal up the plastic. I get the hairdryer and as I return to my father, I forget about the hallway runner. It tangles around my feet and I fall. As I'm on the floor, I think I see someone in the light of the door frame to the stairwell. But when I pull myself up, no one is there. I give the hairdryer to my father and about 10 minutes later, we have the window sealed up. The stairwell door bangs once, and then we hear another door bang and assume it's the basement. We go around and discover the Christmas lights unplugged, which we most definitely know they were not when we left. We return to the party. No one seems to have noticed anything. I explain to my uncle in private what happened. Family starts filtering out and the party ends. My father slips me a swig of rye, to which I cough, splutter, gulp, but do keep down and my mother returns home for midnight mass. We retire upstairs. The change in the house is like entering the eye of a storm. It's suddenly calm and peaceful, but you know, it's only temporary.